Welcome back to the first session of the afternoon on metrics. Uh, it seems that all speakers of this session are going to be live in person here, so exciting. Um, and um, Noma Bashir is our first speaker. He is going to tell us about metrics on sustainable computing. Hi, everyone. My name is Roman Bashir. I'm a research fellow at the University of Massachusetts Amos. Today, I'm going to talk about our work that clarifies key uh, misunderstandings about the carbon footprint of computing and distills some fundamental trends that will govern the future of sustainable computing. The title of the paper is inspired by David McKay's uh, book that aimed to clarify similar misunderstandings about renewable energy in early 2000s. And this paper was a collaborative effort between me, David Irwin, Prashant Shanai, and Abel Sosa. The demand for computing has been growing exponentially for quite some time, and it is expected to accelerate even further. This is because society continues to find useful applications for computing. In this graph, I have uh, time on x-axis, and uh, what, in this graph, I have time on x-axis, and a transistor shift per capita as a proxy for computing demand on y-axis. I have also augmented the graph with key inventions and applications. The idea is to show that uh, the key inventions and applications during the early year of uh, computing were few and far in between, but there has been a slew of new applications and uh, inventions during the last two decades. In my opinion, the, uh, the two things have uh, contrib contributed to this demand. First one is the um, availability of uh, personal uh, computers and mobile devices, uh, along with the availability of cloud platforms such as AWS, GCP, and Azure uh, that allowed everyone and anyone to build applications for these uh, personal devices. This combined with recent explosive growth in ML uh, models usage and their uh, sizes, uh, the demand is going to accelerate even uh, further. And there is no end to this because we are only beginning to apply uh, all these tools that we have developed to different aspects of life, ranging from smart transportation to precision agriculture, smart cities, and whatnot. When it comes to climate change, an important aspect is how this computing demand translates into energy demand. Around 2005, it was predicted that the energy demand of computing will double every five years. However, in 2018, the same set of uh, or same group of people came and updated their analysis and said that the demand, energy demand actually grew only by 6% from 2010 to 2018. While this study is widely quoted, there are other studies that uh, suggest that the actual computing demand may vary any between, uh, anywhere between 200 terawatt hours to 900 terawatt hours. The purpose of mentioning all of this is not to say that one study is better than the other. It is just to point out that uh, despite even the most optimistic analysis, the demand out uh, the energy demand outgrew the uh, improvements in energy efficiency. And one of the uh, key factors in uh, uh, this uh, gains in energy efficiency was a transition from traditional uh, computing, like computing on traditional data centers, which are highly in in energy inefficient, energy efficient to uh, hyperscale cloud-based data centers, which are highly efficient. However, it must be noted that this transition was a one-time gain. And uh, this and other efficiency gains are slowing down while demand is accelerating. So this means that the future growth in demand will directly result in future growth in, in, a, uh, in computing demand will result future growth in energy demand. So computing industry has focused on the energy efficiency so far. This is completely understandable because as high energy efficiency reduces uh, the operational cost. However, when it comes to the climate uh, impact of uh, computing, energy efficiency is not the only metric. A more important or like another metric is the carbon intensity of the energy used to fulfill this demand. The good news is that in United States, the carbon intensity of the grid has been decreasing over the last two decades or so. 
uh, over the last 18 years, the carbon efficiency of the grid increased by 2.33%. And uh, by optimistic analysis, the energy demand grew only by 0.65% per year. So this means that effectively the carbon foot or carbon efficiency of computing actually increased by 1.64% or the carbon footprint decreased. Now this is a good news, but only if the most optimistic estimates about the energy demand are accurate. And also if you only look at uh, the uh, United States or Europe where these uh, carbon intensity has been decreasing. But if you look at the Asia where there has been a massive growth in data center capacity and also like uh, around the world, the grid's carbon intensity has either increased or remained constant. So when you combine uh, like the whole world view along with the potential inaccuracies in the energy demand estimates, the future does not look as rosy. So, so far I have talked about different projections and estimates. Different people will side with different studies that will lead to different conclusions and um, that suits their narrative. So to avoid that problem, we leave these projections and estimates aside and look at the fundamental trends that will determine the future of sustainable computing. So carbon footprint of computing can be computed as the total work done divided by computing's carbon efficiency. So let's look at the top thing. So the total work done is cycles per unit work into total unit of work. So cycles per unit work is also termed as the algorithmic efficiency. So there has been massive increases in algorithmic efficiency over the years, and there are definitely uh, more uh, avenues for further improvement. And industry has very strong incentive to work on that because they, it means that they can do more work for the same amount of money or energy spent. However, despite all of these recent successes and uh, potential uh, future possibilities, algorithmic efficiency has its bound because you cannot do work without at least consuming some amount of cycles. The next one is uh, the total unit of work. So as I discussed earlier, the computing demand is growing and further accelerating. Now the bad thing about this is that industry has no incentive to curb this uh, accelerating demand. Higher demand uh, and even further acceleration in that demand means higher profit and more uh, like sa satisfied uh, stakeholders. So there is no stopping that and uh, I believe that the total unit of work or the amount of work that we will be doing in the future will determine the future of sustainable computing. Now finally, in terms of carbon efficiency, computing's carbon efficiency is a product of computing's energy efficiency and energy's carbon efficiency. So in terms of energy efficiency, there has been massive improvements in computing's energy efficiency and it has been doubling around 1.5 to 2.6 years. However, there is a limit to the energy efficiency and Launder's principle suggests that we may reach the theoretical limit uh, in 2015 or so and practical limit even sooner. Now, there is a possibility of quantum computing and reversible computing. But quantum computing has also limits, while reversible computing is just a theoretical uh, like idea uh, so far and uh, there are no practical uh, use cases yet. On top of that, historically gains in energy efficiency do not lead to a decrease in demand. Instead, Jeevan's paradox suggests that uh, the energy efficiency gains result in even higher e energy demand. And finally, so energy's a carbon efficiency mean uh, like the, it's completely unbounded because you can uh, theoretically do all of your work on zero carbon energy, which means that the energy's carbon efficiency can be infinite. And definitely industry has helped subsidize zero carbon energy by adopting and leading uh, the adoption of uh, carbon footprints. And I discuss this uh, on the next slide, but overall, if you look like most of the things are like bounded and the total demand is unbounded and energy efficiency is unbounded. So in this case, like these are the things that will determine the future. The carbon offsets vary in granularity uh, of scope and time of where the zero carbon uh, energy is used. So on the loosest end, like we have long term and annual offsets that count their emissions and offset them by purchasing carbon credits that either uh, 
avoided or uh, captured carbon dioxide emissions at some time and some location. A better and stricter, uh, a better and stricter of, uh, offset is the time-based uh, energy attribute certificate that Google piloted and is uh, being adopted by many uh, of the industries. It is also termed as 24-7 carbon matching. The goal of this particular offset is to match the use of carbon-free energy in the, on the same grid in the same hour. While this offset is the best in class right now, this should not be the end goal. Because unless the data center is directly powered by uh, the carbon-free energy, it relies on presence of carbon-intensive energy on the grid to, uh, for grid's reliable operation. As a result, uh, you are carbon-free only when everyone has become carbon-free. And we think that like the uh, total carbon emissions of the grid should be divided uh, to the all users based on their energy consumption. And at this point, I will loosely quote Andrew Chance, like who says that uh, all of these offsets and mechanisms are really good and welcome addition from the industry, but we should try to do like better and aim for the best. So, so far I have discussed the trends in operational carbon. However, there has been an increased focus on embodied carbon as you must have noticed in the earlier talks. These are the emissions that come from producing products and services. There are some fundamental differences in embodied and operational carbon. For example, embodied carbon is directly under your control. Yes, uh, focusing on embodied carbon can motivate companies to use their facilities a little bit longer or, uh, or equipment a little bit longer as suggested by many talks. It can also incentivize people to buy from a manufacturer that is uh, greener. But at the same time, my embodied carbon is someone's operational carbon. If everyone reduces their operational carbon, embodied carbon will also uh, reduce. And also, operation, as I said, operational carbon is completely under our control, and it is not a solved problem. So I'm not, I want to clarify that I'm not saying that embodied or uh, like operational carbon, one is more important than other or vice versa. What I am saying is that one is under your direct control and others is not. And there is also a potential that a focus on embodied can distract you from reducing your operational carbon. So finally, what does all of this mean for sustainable computing? The first step is we need to clarify the misunderstanding surrounding the carbon footprint of computing. Industry is taking massive steps in reducing their carbon footprint and they champion their success. That is totally understandable. However, as clear from a question on Slack, if you go to Slack and look at a question thread after the keynote, these claims can give a false impression that operational carbon is either a solved problem or will be a solved problem. So therefore we need to clarify these things so that people understand the importance of uh, reducing operational carbon. Second thing is once we have that consensus, uh, we need some tools that allow us to reduce operational carbon. And there are companies like Watt Time and Electricity Map that are enabling visibility into the carbon footprint of applications through providing average or marginal carbon e emission values. Then once we move a little bit further, we need to uh, shift focus from energy efficiency to carbon efficiency. So there is currently no direct or financial incentive to reduce carbon. And everything in computer science is uh, motivated by economic gains, like to run faster, to do more work, and things like that. It is very surprising that computer science is probably the only science that is driven by economic incentives, not like, for example, chemistry, biology, physics. There is no direct incentive over there. So a lot of things in computing sciences determine like what is being done by economic incentive, which may not always be a good solution. And finally, once we have more and more renewable or carbon-free energy resources, we need to change how we operate. Like we are more, like computing is a highly flexible load and it can help you on both ends of the spectrum. In the first side, it can allow you to move to lower carbon energy resources and things like that. And on the other end, 
the flexibility of computing can allow you to balance grid by responding and participating in demand response programs and things like that. I will end the talk with the following takeaways uh, that operational carbon footprint is not a solved problem. And due to increasing demand, this problem is going to get only worse. Offsets are good, but they are not the panacea of like uh, our efforts. Embodied and operational carbons are not additive in my opinion. And finally, operational carbon is directly under our control and we should leverage computing's flexibility to help make this transition and uh, while also balancing the grid. Thank you. Thank you, Norman. Questions for Norman? While Andrew sets up, we'll leave to the next. Should I? No, 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 I, I need to be able to. Okay. Anyone? Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. I, I had kind of like a small question. Like, can you give some example where energy efficiency is high, but carbon efficiency is low? Like some uh, simple example off the bat. Energy efficiency is high, but carbon efficiency is not. Yeah. So you can have a data center that is running completely on coal or like, I think Poland has quite a lot of like high carbon intensity. So over there, you may have a data center that consumes very little amount of energy, but due to the grid's carbon intensity, it's carbon efficiency would be very low as compared to let's say Ontario, which has very low uh, carbon intensity. So if you work something like run something in, not efficiently over there, you will be less energy efficient, but high carbon efficient. Like, let's say if a data set, a data center is running on windmills or something. Sorry? If, if the data center is running on windmills or something, then less energy efficient, but more carbon efficient. Yeah, right? not even that. Like, I mean, that is the uh, probably the end goal or something. But uh, right now, Ontario overall has a low carbon intensity because they produce a lot from hydro. 60% okay. comes see, from hydro or something like that. Okay, thank you.